This episode of Tales from Ostlantis is brought to you by Ostlantis Premium. Don't you just hate having your favorite podcast interrupted by ads like this? Well, dear listener, you're in luck. Because starting at just three bucks a month, you can support independent Chicano media and receive ad-free episodes, premium episodes, bonus content, and access to our Discord server. Just visit talesfromastlantis.com and click Go Premium, or follow the link in the show notes. And now, on with the show. You must excuse me. I've grown quite where I... This hasn't been easy, I know. But you've learned a lesson. A lesson in honesty. Honesty to yourself and honesty to others. That lesson will stand you in good stead all your life. I think we've all learned a good lesson. I've always heard that honesty is the best policy. Now I'm catching on to why that's so, and why that's so, and why that's Greetings, so, why dear that's listeners, so. and welcome to yet another episode of Tales from Astlantis. We are your hosts, Curly Tlapoyawa. And Ruben Arellano Tlacateca. How are you, my friend? I'm doing great. It's a beautiful day out there. We've had a lot of rain lately, but today, the last couple of days, has been chilly, chillier than usual for this time of year in March, mid-March, late March. Um, but it's uh, it's a nice day, it's a sunny day, and uh, hopefully we can get um, some more of this beautiful, beautiful uh, weather out here in Dallas. How's New Mexico? How's Albuquerque? Oh, well, that sounds very nice. It's actually, I, you know, if you'll notice, I'm wearing a jacket today because yeah. <laughs> it's actually pretty chilly. Uh, in the house, and I didn't want to turn on the heat while we were recording because I didn't okay. want that background hum oh, screwing right. up our background. sound. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, oh, I'll just throw on a jacket. Nice. Plus, you know, I wasn't lucky enough to grow up in a house with uh, a heater, so we had a wood burning right. stove. So that's same here. <laughs> I'm kind of used to you know just dealing with what you got to deal with. It was exactly. always cold in the morning until you got that fire going. In the summer, my, my AC was cracking open the window and putting a fan in it, blowing that hot air. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was air. Like, at least it was something. Like, it was something like wa- wa- wafting, wafting yeah. over the, the sweat of your body, right? Yeah, that was right. cooling you That's down. That's what cooled you down. Exactly. I know exactly what that was like. Cause we, and then we, uh, we moved up and we got a, a swamp cooler that my dad mounted in the window right in the kitchen, mm-hmm. but it wasn't hooked up to anything. So me, my brother, and my sister would take turns and one of us would have to go outside with the hose and just like stand wow. outside, sweating your ass off in this summer heat, just hosing down the, the pads on the side of the, the swamp right. cooler just so it would stay cool inside for a little cool bit inside, and then yeah, you'd run yeah. in and then as soon as it started warming up you'd be all right it's your turn <laughs> <laughs> Take, taking turns damn ah, the good old now days. we had uh here in tech at least in this part of texas we had we had the luxury of having once we did get window units uh these are your typical ac you know freon cooled units so we didn't have to do all that like when i was in el paso back in uh when i taught there for a year as a visiting professor at utep um like that, since it's you know El Paso is kind of right there, it's next to New Mexico. So like they adopt a lot of the the things that that come from New Mexico, and so most of the people there also have swamp coolers. I think maybe a few people now might have you know uh, ACs that run with uh, coolant, but it's mainly all. And I was a little surprised because I had no idea what that was until I went out there and like, what is this swamp cooler stuff? <laughs> Never heard of it. <sighs> Oh, I remember. Yeah. I remember. No. So speaking of hot, have you seen any hot movies lately? <laughs> well, yes, sir, I have. Um glad to announce that as of yesterday, the Casa Grandes movie was like number three in the world on Netflix. Outstanding, man. That's, that's congratulations thank to you, you. Thank you. Puga and, and the whole crew. Yeah, Miguel Puga, the director. Um Fantastic work. Uh, Lalo Alcaraz worked on it. Um, right. Just a lot of great talent was brought in. And, um, you know, when we saw how well it was doing, uh, Puga sent out this 
text to everybody that said, uh, our little Chicanita has wings. So Right on. So it's, it awesome. feels really good. Yeah, we watched it, man. It was, it was, it was, it was great, man. I, oh, I loved it. You. you know, yeah. Yeah, I was. Um, I wish I wish we'd had stuff like this when I was growing up. You know, even when my daughter was small. You know, she's seventeen now, and so she she sat there. She she kind of muscled through it because you know how teens are. Yeah, like, oh yeah. my god, I'm sitting here, but she enjoyed it. You know, for the most part, she also appreciated the fact that it spoke to her on a cultural level. So that that was really good. Yeah, I'm I'm really proud of it. Um, and word word on the street is is we've got more work coming. Um, nice. So, you know, as long as as long as people watch it and support it, then it shows the powers that be that there is an audience for this kind of material, for these kind of stories and that are being told in a in a meaningful way by people themselves. Right. Like we're telling our own stories and it's appealing not just to our own people, but throughout the world. Obviously, I mean, it was number three in the world. So it's uh, it's got mass appeal and um it's just showing like brown people can carry uh, a movie. Nice. Well, again, like I said, congratulations to you and everyone. It's, it's, uh, and so we hope to see more of that in the future. Thanks, man. It means a lot. I was very happy. So we've got this um, eclipse coming up. Right. And uh, some pretty interesting uh, perspectives. Uh, now, is the eclipse going to... Uh, um, be significant over in your part of the world because I know, like here, and at least in Dallas, and, and uh, you know, it's gonna it's gonna run kind of like in a diagonal fashion from like uh, south west uh, Texas uh, through central Texas up through northeast Texas where I am at, and so Dallas is kind of like right in the the path of totality. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the- and so I'm not sure, like, to what extent, like, to what percentage uh, the the upcoming eclipse is going to be. Uh, over in like the percentage over in in New Mexico and your part of the, I mean it doesn't really, you know, pass over us. Uh, I'm looking at a map right now. It says we'll have like an Albuquerque seventy to eighty percent, seventy to eighty percent, which is still okay. pretty high. Yeah, it is. It is pretty pretty high. And then it, it wow. you know tapers off the further you you get to the in either direction horizontally. Nice. But yeah, yeah, we're gonna be in the path of totality, and in fact, um, uh, I received an email a few days ago from, and I was already planning on giving the students a day off anyway, but uh, um, they sent an email that because we're gonna have a uh, high volume of uh, visitors coming into, you know, certain parts of the state. Dallas is one of those, you know, because of DFW, we have people coming in from all over mm-hmm. the world to witness this thing, and uh, they're saying that perhaps. Um, I know that the uh, the ISD, the local school district's gonna. Um, I know they've already announced that they're not going to be uh, running the the buses that day. So oh, wow. maybe they're kind of giving a hint that maybe they're going to be closing. And so we got we got the uh, the uh, alert as well at at uh, Mountain View that perhaps maybe we should uh, take those uh, considerations. <laughs> so they're not saying we want you to give them the day off. Right. So I took a vote in class. I told students who wants to come in on the day of the eclipse and spend some time with your, with your uh, beloved professor, or you want (laughs) to take the day off and experience this once in a lifetime event. And so by a show of hands, tell me who wants to come in. And like one student kind of like, you know, raised his hand, but not really. He was being a little facetious. I'm like, yeah, I get it. I'm going to give you guys a day off. So you didn't get that one kid in the in the front who's like, well, can we get some extra credit work if we want to? Uh. And can you assign us some readings? And all the other students yeah. are like, man, shut the fuck up. <laughs> right? No, it doesn't get that good. I mean, it gets good, but it don't get that good. <laughs> So, so this this episode that we're doing was prompted because um, so a few months ago, um, a, a, a team of artists um, that go by the name of Point A. I'm not sure what what it stands for, but that's it's a it's a, a gentleman and, and a lady uh, who do a lot of multimedia work and a lot of stuff with technology and sound and stuff. And so they reached out to the Indigenous Cultures Institute which uh, I'm a part of, and uh, they they wanted to see if uh, we would give them an indigenous perspective on the eclipse because they're working on a project that's entitled Eclipsing, which is what they call a site-responsive 
art installation that combines performance, practice, interactivity, sound art, and other media in a public space. So they interviewed various people. That I think they interviewed uh, like a cosmologist or an astronomer, um, uh, other local artists from the area, you know, people like that. And so they wanted to get also an indigenous perspective, right? And so the ICI passed on the email to me. And so I reached out to him and I was curious. I'm like, that's interesting that you're doing this because, you know, honestly, I hadn't really considered, you know, looking into it. Uh, as busy as I am with stuff, I, you know, just yeah. one more thing to add to my plate, right? So I was like, let me take a look. Let me see. I can't promise you anything, but let me see what I can find. And then so sure enough, I did some digging and also like talked to, you know, several folks and uh, I was able to cobble up a few things. And uh, so the, um, the episode that, that you're about to hear is basically, it's not exactly what they used in, in, in the audio because they use audio in this, in this uh, sound walk. So w what you do is, so they start at the long center, which is um, like a mm -hmm. multimedia plex in Austin. That's right next to uh, what they call Lady Bird Lake, which is, it's really a, um, of uh, a man-made lake that was created in the middle of, of downtown Austin, but it's it really it's it's part of the the river system the, the, that runs through through Austin, the Colorado River, and so the Long Center is right next to the river, and they have a set of trails that go that crisscross across the river, and they go along the side of the riverbank, and so what they did is they um, they did like a two mile. Uh, trek where at various points they had stops and and so what you do is you download this app and you're listening to it through your headphones and they have um, paid actors who are part of the uh, the the whole experience and as you're walking uh, through the you know the, the trail you have people that are kind of talking you see people arguing you see people engaging in various activities and if you go like if you look down. Uh, towards a, a field, you might see like a group of people doing some choreographic, um, not a dance, but you know, like like movements and like turns mm -hmm. and to get your attention. And as this is happening at the same time, you're also listening to the various people that were interviewed, the artists themselves who are you know kind of philosophizing and and talking about the eclipse and going into uh, wow. existentialism. That sounds like a total immersive experience. It is. Right? It is a very immersive experience. And so what they did is they, they asked me uh, uh, to do a, a uh, because they featured this during the uh, South by Southwest um, event that, that just occurred a few weeks ago. And so they invited a few folks before they did the actual launch on the weekend before South by Southwest to so that we can get a preview of it. So they did a preview walk. And so we went down there for that. And uh, it's about a two mile uh, hike, and it took about an hour and a half or so for the whole thing from start to finish. And it was a very, very uh, unique experience. And and so what they did is they interviewed me, and so we we did a Zoom for about an hour. And so they used like you know how it goes when you're doing these kind of things, you know, like you're gonna maybe use one or two minutes out of the whole thing. Um, but it was it was cool because yeah. they they actually the the clips that they used from from the Zoom call were uh things that i think were very important that they caught on uh, during the talk that 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 um uh, really added some some necessary um interpretation historical interpretation from an indigenous perspective on on eclipses and so i had actually written out like this whole script that i was going to like hand over to him but i was like you know what maybe i should just hold on to this and and maybe we can make an episode out of it so here we are yeah <laughs> well planned, <laughs> sir. Like, eh, let me hold off on this. <laughs> well, with that being said, oh, and is that if, you know is they that still they going sent on? an email um, last week that um, it was only going on during the South by Southwest uh, event, but they're working with the Long Center to bring it back. Um, hopefully, either around the eclipse uh and if so that, that it's probably going to run through may but they're going to update us all on on the process uh yeah awesome. so if you're in the austin area um in april and possibly through may um make sure you go to the long center and you or you can go to their website and and um they uh they have more information on there and they give the dates right now the dates is still uh, the old dates through March the 12th, 
Um, so if you are listening to this in late March, early April, just uh, go to the longcenter.org website and uh, look for uh, the Eclipse uh, project. It's called Eclipsing. And uh, hopefully they'll give us some updates pretty soon on whether or not they're going to be doing this uh, sound walk again. That's awesome, man. Well, with that being said, let's get into this episode. Eclipse Apocalypse. When celestial events like an eclipse or a comet occurred, Kabultekan people would make special offerings to mark the occasion. These natural phenomena were personified and incorporated into the social, cultural, and spiritual belief system of the community. The phenomena, while infrequent, were not completely misunderstood by native peoples. Kwabultekans in particular personified them in order to make sense of their meaning. So yes, while these events can be interpreted through a spiritual lens, they were also incorporated as a practical way of making note of these natural occurrences. For many indigenous people, a tension and balance between the spiritual and rational has existed in relation to celestial events. In that sense, these phenomena became stand-ins for characters in the story of creation and life itself. The sun, moon, earth, and stars were embodiments of important ancestors, and in many ceremonies, people in this community would take on the persona of these ancestors, who in turn were themselves avatars of celestial and terrestrial natural phenomena. The people in the community who were selected to be avatars took on the role of the characters in those stories. So it was understood that since the ancestors live and breathe through their avatars, they also had human needs, such as thirst and hunger, and the offerings symbolized that needed sustenance. Typical Kualtekan offerings were deer, spring water, and smoke from embers of a ceremonial fire. Other items included corn, beans, squash, pecans, mesquite beans, and deer or rabbit. One thing to keep in mind is that celestial phenomena can be predicted when studied long enough, especially over generations. And that was true of many, if not all, indigenous people. One of the things that is fascinating about our ancestors was their ability to predict eclipses using planetary observation. For instance, in the case of eclipses, oral history states that an eclipse occurs when the sun and the moon, the primordial ancestors, meet to reaffirm their promise to the people that they will never be alone in their spiritual journey. Even though they must separate, they promise to meet again during the next eclipse. It is said that the ancestors made a promise to the people that nothing would harm the people as long as the two travel through the sky and that everything would be good for the people. The sun and the moon promised to lead the way for eternity, and their meeting, or eclipse, is the renewal of that covenant that they share with us on earth. The duty of the people in this covenant was to build the ceremonial fire and make offerings which consisted of food, water, and incense, such as sweetgrass, tobacco, and cedar. The point was to direct the smoke from the fire towards the eclipse as a way to demonstrate to the ancestors, which were personified by the sun, by the sun and the moon, that they were still carrying on the traditions and ways of the people and that they were thankful for keeping their promises. The devotion to these traditions, as with any generation, always varies, and the most devout and ardent keepers of the old ways might engage in a little bit of bloodletting and offer it to the fire as a sign of the utmost respect they have to the personified ancestors. The maintenance of the tradition was a collective affair, but it was the elders, the leaders of the bands, clans, and tribes, as well as the medicine people, the healers, who were the main people responsible for making sure that the rituals were carried out and passed on to the next generation. Today, these ways are still observed by traditional members of the various Kualtekan communities and other native peoples of Texas, but they have changed to accommodate the centuries of forced adaptation as well as 
through the natural progression of cultural evolution. Therefore, not all Texas Indians today might be following the same path from one community to the next, and that's perfectly fine. But most importantly, the thing to remember here is that each and every one of these observances is both equally indigenous and equally valid. In general, the significance of eclipses for native peoples of Texas varied greatly depending on the specific tribe or community. There's no single unified belief across a diverse array of cultures throughout the state. However, we can explore some general themes and examples. Let's look at some of the spiritual and symbolic points of importance. Point 1. Eclipses were a symbol of renewal and rebirth, and some tribes, like the Karankawa, viewed them as a time of renewal and rebirth. They believed the sun was being consumed and reborn, signifying a fresh start for the world. Point 2. Another interpretation is that of balance and harmony. Many tribes viewed eclipses as disruptions to the natural order, representing imbalances or conflicts in the cosmos. To restore balance and prevent further cosmic disharmony, certain rituals were performed. These included singing, dancing, or praying in a ceremonial setting. Point three. And of course, there's also the oral historical aspect to natural phenomena. For instance, some Caddo peoples had a tale of a celestial bear trying to devour the sun, with the eclipse representing its struggle. This metaphor can only be understood through a cultural lens, but it generally represented a form of renewal. So again, it depends on who you ask and their specific traditional understanding. There are also some cultural observances and practices associated with eclipses that might be more familiar due to their shared similarities with cultures around the world. 1. There was a sense of respectful avoidance of eclipses. While some societies actively engaged with them through rituals, others believed it was disrespectful or dangerous to witness eclipses directly. The Comanche, for instance, might stay indoors and cover their mirrors during an eclipse. 2. And if you're trying to avoid the phenomena, your culture might engage in noise-making rituals. Certain tribes, like the Apache, might beat drums and shout to scare away the celestial creature believed to be attacking the sun or moon. Others, like the Wichita, might perform ceremonial dances or offer prayers for the return of light. 3. And... Just as any other culture around the world might have interpreted this celestial occurrence, eclipses symbolized predictions and omens. They could also serve as prophetic signs which foretold future events or indicated some impending danger. These in turn would be explained through the duration of the eclipse or the color of the obscured sun. We'll be back after a quick break. Have you picked up your Mexica calendar for the year 12 Flint? Or how about a paperback copy of The Four Disagreements? Just visit talesfromastlantis.com for all the latest merchandise and show some love for your favorite podcast. That's talesfromastlantis.com for all the latest merchandise. Now, back to the show. What's important here is that indigenous Americans were no different than any other human culture. Their observations of the natural world would be informed by their environment and cultural understanding. It's also useful to remember that a lot of the knowledge of the cosmos was inherited from previous generations through time and space, going back to the dawn of humanity. By the time indigenous Americans are making their observations, Celestial movements could be done with precise accuracy, depending on the maintenance of those knowledges by any given group at any given moment. Now, Quahuatecans, for Quahuatecan people in particular, our understanding of eclipses is a bit fractured, but we do know a few of the old rituals as previously described. This fragmentation is primarily due to several factors, such as historical disruptions, lack of written records, 
and conflicting interpretations by Europeans who described them. Historical Disruptions The Coahuiltecans who inhabited Coahuila and parts of Texas and northern Mexico faced immense pressure and displacement during the colonial period. Many of their oral traditions and cultural practices have been lost or fragmented. Lack of written records. The Coahuiltecans lacked a written language, making it difficult to directly access their perspectives on celestial phenomena like eclipses. Most information comes from secondary sources, such as Spanish missionary accounts, which can be filtered through colonial biases. Conflicting Interpretations Even with missionary accounts, interpretations of Coahuiltecan beliefs about eclipses can be challenging. Different missionaries might document seemingly conflicting narratives, reflecting either variations in Coahuiltecan traditions or limitations in understanding and translation. But despite these limitations, we do understand the significance of eclipses for some Coahuiltecan groups. These include the reenactment ceremony of the primordial deities, the sun and the moon, and the role of the medicine people during the event, as was previously described. Coahuiltecan peoples revered celestial bodies, particularly the sun and the moon, as powerful deities. The eclipse was interpreted as the keeping of cultural continuity through the metaphorical promise made by the personified ancestors. This tradition was kept by the medicine people who were responsible for preparing ahead of time and for conducting the rituals. They played a crucial role in mediating relationships with the spirit world and celestial forces, and they performed specific ceremonial rituals during eclipses to maintain a cosmic balance. And as a historian, I also like the added dimension that often gets overlooked in discussions about indigenous rituals related to cosmological events. That is, that the rituals and ceremonies not only served spiritual and cultural purposes, but that they were also a way of reminding the people that these things happen from time to time. So in reality, people weren't really that surprised when an eclipse occurred, mm -hmm. because it was already an integral part of the oral history that was passed down from one generation to the next. That's really cool. I like the um, the personifications, right? Um, in in Mexica tradition, there's something very similar called the Ishiptla or the Teo Ishiptla, and that means um, literally the uh, the representation, or some people gloss it as the impersonator or the sacred impersonator. But these were people who would participate in ceremony and, uh, you know, take on the part of a teteo for the purpose of that ceremony. So it seems like there's some crossover there. Are these the ones that were made with, um, I'm trying to remember, was it amaranth or was it something else? To... Yeah. So there were different types of ishipla, right? There were human ishipla, mm -hmm. like an individual would, would, you know, for the sake of this ceremony, you are Tlaloc or you are Tezcatlipoca. And then in other times of the year, depending on the importance of the ceremony, there would be ishipla made out of amaranth, which would be, you know, baked into these big cakes, and then they would be consumed right. at the end of the ceremony. And then you would also see ishipla made out of paper. And um, in the Huasteca, they continue that tradition to this day. They have the uh, the paper that they cut out into the shape of the teteo and use them as representations of the teteo mm -hmm. for their ceremonies. So that's all really cool. I like um, that you talked about the different approaches that indigenous people have towards uh, eclipses because when you only hear one approach or one view it it kind of colors your perception as like, oh, all natives think this way about it. But right. it's like you said, for some, it's like it's about harmony and tradition. But for other, like for the Mexica, it was definitely um, like they saw the sun was being under attack. Was it like doom and but, gloom for the Mexica? Is that what I'm trying? I'm hearing from you. It, it Yeah. I mean, it was some time where it was like, you know, definitely a, a time for concern mm. because the idea was that a, a jaguar, um, well, there's two 
two versions of it. In one, either a, a jaguar is trying to consume the sun. Interesting. Which I think stretches across a lot of cultures, this idea. Because I know in China, it's a dragon mm -hmm. um, trying to consume the sun. And then you had mentioned a bear. The bear, yeah. The bear consuming the sun. And the response with the Mexica and the Chinese was similar in that you would make a lot of noise. Right. And sing and, and have ceremony and do all this loud noise making because you're trying to scare away uh, the jaguar, right? Yeah. And then the other version of it or view of the eclipse uh, is that the sun is being attacked by the uh, the tzitzimit, tzitzimime, mm -hmm. right? Who um, they call them the star demons. And right. Yes. Before you all write in angrily, I know we didn't have <laughs> demons. And blah blah. But you know that the the you know when you have the total eclipse, you could sometimes see stars on the periphery of the sun. And that those were viewed as like, well, those are the tzitzimime that are attacking the sun. Interesting. And, and that if you went outside, uh, especially if you were a man, that they could possess you. Oh, wow. And uh, take you over. Yeah. So it's uh, it's pretty cool. If you look up uh, tzitzimime on Google or or whatever in the, in the codices, the way they're depicted is pretty horrifying <laughs> does this like, tie in to to the nawales somehow the whole the you know tradition of, so. of the shapeshifter i don't think so i think okay. it's a it's a separate uh tradition because the tzitzimime were associated with uh the siwateteo right mm -hmm. which were like the the sacred women um and with coatlicue sitlalicue and siwakoat so it's very strong feminine energy right like the the female representations of the teteo mm. and that the leader of the tzitzime were um the tzitzime were uh, was uh it's mm. so when, when mm -hmm. you see images of it's papalot she she bears those uh representations of of the tzitzime which is they're like skeletal creatures and on their joints or the points of articulation are star symbols, like connecting themselves into one being. And that they have uh, serpents usually crawling out of their nether regions. And they look horrific. It's, they're pretty badass. Two things uh, stand out from your description. One, first of all, is it similar to the way that the Virgin de Guadalupe is kind of depicted with stars on her cloak? In a sense, interesting, right? Hmm. Um, well, and the, are the stars the stars are five point stars or what kind of stars? Well, are they? they're they're the uh, Mesoamerican, the Mexica depiction of the stars, so they look like Pokemon balls, right? Where they're the circles with the little dot in the middle, and they're half red, oh, right? Yes, half white. Yes, yes. So right. it's mm -hmm. that style of star, and they're actually parts of their body, of their skeletal frame. So they're not yeah. wearing like clothing and then the stars are on the clothing. Like the stars are them. Like they rep they are the mm -hmm. stars. I love how, because I, I go on these tours. Like when I, um, when I was working at Chaco at night, we went on this tour, the, uh, the starlight tour of, of uh, Pueblo Bonito. And so all these archaeologists head out there and the tour guides leading us through. And he, the, the story is so quaint and, and beautiful. It's a beautiful story. Uh, it, but it's a Pueblo story of, you know, the stars and the moon. And, and it's very cool, right? The the coyote trickster and, you know, the, the the grandmother and all of this. Meanwhile, the Mexica story is like so violent. And it's like, and then he, you know, killed his 400 brothers and cast them across the sky and they became because right. you know those stars. mexica were just a bunch of violent individuals <laughs> well we like to fight we, we liked to throw down and mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but um one of my favorite depictions of a uh of an eclipse is in the uh teleriano remensis and i think it's folio 40 V and it's up in the upper right hand corner is a, is an image 
representing an, an eclipse of the sun. What's the image? It's like the, uh, so you could see the, the land. There's like a symbol for the land. And then there's, because this was a post-conquest document, the image of the sun, I mean, of the moon is like a, uh, that crescent, the crescent moon. Yeah. But it's like rising up in front of the Mexica symbol of the sun. So uh -huh. it's like, it was almost, you know, if you think of it this way from perspective, right? Like you're standing on the earth and you're looking up and you're seeing the moon uh -huh. in front of the sun. So right. it, it showed a pretty advanced understanding of what was happening at that moment, you know? So it kind of reminded me of those ceramic, um, uh, I'm not sure what they're called, but like these things that, that kind of like show the moon and, and, and the sun kind of together, like interlocking there you go thank you yeah yeah in fact is I, it kind of like that yeah um in fact we use that image in the casa grande's movie as like a, a transition between it. scenes yeah that's so what reminded me of i was it. very proud of that moment there's a lot of stuff so in that movie that i'm very proud was of. casa grande alluding to the upcoming eclipse in that in that uh, uh we were making there? a prophecy yes yeah <laughs> the prophecies are coming true the prophecies truly. are coming true we we're number three in the world well, one of my uh, – speaking of prophecies, you know, let's let's bring it into the modern era because – Everybody's favorite subject, prophecies. Prophecies. Especially if it's end time. Yeah, right. So, you know, we covered traditional indigenous perspectives of the uh, – of, of an eclipse. And I know one thing that, you know, Eurocentric – uh, folks on the right like to do is kind of belittle uh, indigenous perspectives and say, oh, they were so superstitious and this and that, and that's why they needed Jesus, right? So I thought, you know, look, look, I thought of, I would look into some current perspectives coming from our, uh, our Christian friends okay. about the upcoming eclipse. And boy, howdy, if this shit comes to pass, we're in trouble, my friend, because apparently... <laughs> The, this eclipse, according to folks like Alex Jones, for example, this eclipse is going to be used as an event by the New World Order. They're going to capitalize on the, on the eclipse and the Department of Homeland Security, for some reason, <laughs> is going to use it as a way to instill, like take our guns or something. I don't know. They didn't really get into it. They're, he's very vague on, on uh, you know, the particulars. But uh, I thought it would be fun to uh, play some some audio, and this is from a video that uh, that our sh friend of the show, Alex Jones, friend of uh, the show, <laughs> played on his uh, on his show. So uh, check check this out, my friend. Confronted by a new world order and a U.S. president that is carrying out their silent war. We are living in a time of reckoning, and through signs, God is speaking directly to those with ears to listen. In Genesis 1.14, God declared yep. the sun and the moon were for signs. Right. The only signs they can give is eclipses, all right? And the well, that's not the only eclipses, signs. No false prophet can manipulate it. Solar eclipse means judgment is coming upon a nation. Since we become a nation in <laughs> 1776, okay. there has only been eight... <laughs> Total solar eclipses that have completely crossed the United States. Two okay. of them oh, occurred great. during the Revolutionary War. Three of them occurred during the Civil War. Of course. Two of them occurred during the Vietnam War. Of those eight, only one, which was the one seven years ago, it only crossed the United States and no other country. Oh my right. gosh, what's up with this guy's voice? Mm -hmm. And first of all, all I'm getting out of this is that the United States is always at war. So I'm not sure what <laughs> what message he's trying to put out there other than the fact that uh, we're always at war, it, it seems. So this next one comes from TikTok, and I'm not okay. going to give... The this should be fun. TikTok user's name because I don't want to promote any of the nonsense that they're pushing. They don't need any more listeners than they already have, believe me. And 
this guy is obsessed with the fact that the path of the eclipse is going to cross over towns named Nineveh or Nimavah or whatever. I don't really care. I think it's Nineveh. But that somehow this relates to a story of Jonah and, you know, a prophecy in the Bible. It's just pure nonsense. And given the Christianity, you know, pushed in this country, it's hardly any surprise that there would be biblically named towns in the United States. So this is nothing interesting. It's nothing unique. It's 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 a coincidence. It's a strange coincidence, I guess, if you're looking for dots to connect. But check this guy out. This um the the level of fear mongering that they're trying to spread by using the eclipse is pretty interesting. Check him out. Did you know that the solar eclipse happening on April 8th is a lot more crucial than you think? <gasps> Jesus spoke Hell about Matthew that this evil, adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign shall be given to it except for the sign that happened in the days of the prophet Jonah. In Luke, it says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be as the coming of the Son of Man. Well, there you but have you will it. not believe the path of the solar eclipse will take. The hell you It'll say. cross over several towns named Nineveh no. and even Rapture, Indiana. Get but that's out. not even the crazy part. It, it isn't? also goes over the Ark and it'll happen under the constellation Cetus, which Whoa. is a whale, which is what swallowed up Jonah. Subscribe right now. At no, I don't think we'll subscribe. <laughs> well, holy shit. That's some fascinating information there, Professor. And now, according to this next guy, um, the Eclipse is a sign that we are going to experience massive natural catastrophes. So calamities are on their way, according to this next individual. And I believe this guy's from TikTok also. So um, let's, uh, let's give his prophecies a listen. <laughs> Stop and listen. Stop what you're doing. Things about the eclipse that you this guy's about yet. to ruin. No, I'm not going to talk about how it forms the illa for the Tav or how it goes through all the cities of Nineveh. More Thank goodness. I'm going to talk about something in our past. Uh oh. Did you know that in 1811 we had a solar eclipse <gasps> that was preceded two weeks earlier by a partial lunar eclipse? This is the second solar eclipse that we had in the early 1800s. The reason this is important is because what's up with the these, Michael Myers style Halloween music? Did uh, John Carpenter score this guy's TikTok exact, account? <laughs> followed by six to ten thousand in the Booth Hill of Missouri, where the New Madrid fault line is. You should pause and read this because you'll see that we had some as strong as eight point eight in the series following the solar eclipse. Here's where it starts to get interesting. It's Finally, the Mississippi River ran backwards for three hours, as well as many other earthquake phenomena. I bet you didn't hear about that in history class. Stay with me because this is where it gets interesting. There was sand boils, seismic. I thought it was going to get interesting before. Earthquake lights, earthquake smog, thunder, and animal warnings. I suggest you pause and read those to see what was going on. What's really interesting is the earthquake smog. It says the skies turned dark during the earthquakes, so dark that the light of lamps didn't help, and the air smelled bad, and that it was hard to breathe. I suggest you just pause and read some of the scriptures that I put here before continuing on, because I'm trying to make this as short as possible. Well, you failed in making it as short as possible. <laughs> so the idea is this, the path is going to pass over um, towns named Nibiva. And apparently this is a big deal because Jonah was told to go convert Christians and he went to a town called Nibiva and that an eclipse happened. And that's what caused all the people in the town to convert. And somehow this is translates to some prophecy of like mass conversion of people like the the eclipse is going to cause this mass conversion of, of people to, to Jesus. But then this other guy says... Uh, in a in another clip that uh, it's going to just cause like mass uh global disaster environmental disaster earthquakes fucking dogs and cats living right. together i was just thinking that mass hysteria <laughs> <laughs> i'm like who are you going to call man <laughs> yeah yeah so i'm 
I'm going to go out on a limb here, my friend. We're recording this episode before the actual eclipse. Mm -hmm. So we don't know if any of these prophecies are actually going to happen. But I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to say that everything's going to be okay. I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't think we're going to see, you know, one, a mass conversion to, to Christianity because of the, the path cross, you know, crossing over towns named Mibava. Um, and I don't think we're going to see, you know, civil unrest. And I don't think we're going to see mass earthquakes or anything. I, I think what's going to happen is, is, Families are going to go out and they're going to put on their glasses and they're going to look up and they're going to be able to enjoy something that our our ancestors, that the humanity's mm. ancestors have in, have witnessed for millennia, and um, you know, just just take that in. And what what's interesting though is I saw on Newsweek, I think it was Newsweek, they put out this story how in Oklahoma, because I guess Oklahoma is like right in the path, yeah. um that they're calling out the national guard to sort of help with crowd control mm. because they're expecting so many freaking people to show up right. to watch this event that they need some sort of, you know, they lack the infrastructure basically to accommodate the the numbers of people that they're expecting. Yeah. So they're calling up, you know, national guard to help um, with crowd control, basically. Wow. And so, of course, the conspiracy theorists are going through the roof with right. this. Um, and you know, what's going to happen? What are they going to the do? The government's involved, the military's involved, and anything that is meant to actually help, they, these people always twist it around and make it some kind of nefarious uh, affair, right? Like, what is the federal yeah. government up to? Are they going to, like... Mr. Jones here, like back in the day, like one of the things that he was famous for incorrectly um, uh, prophesying was that the federal government was going to have these uh, detention centers throughout the state of Texas. Oh. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah, I remember. Right? Yeah, I remember uh, that. Post 9-11, you know, when he just went off the rails and it's like, dude, please bring it back. Tone it down a bit. It's going to be all right. <laughs> like Zap from Zap and Roger used to say, it's all right. It's going to be all right, man. Don't worry about it. <laughs> well, the, the problem with people like uh, Jones and, and his listeners and, and the people making these bizarre TikTok, you know, videos claiming that the world's going to end or that some great cataclysm is coming is they just don't like the truth. Mm. That's that's their problem. It's, they're allergic to the truth. I like to say. Yeah, and what what is it about the truth that they're allergic to? Well, it's uh, it's it's because the truth is like medicine. Ah, uh, so they're allergic to medicine. They, they are allergic to medicine. It's interesting. It's uh, quite the phenomenon amongst conspir conspiracists. But you know what's funny? Like within medicine, people they understood the eclipse. So there's a connection there. Hey now. They understood the truth well, because yeah, because the they understood the truth and they were medicine. And they knew it doesn't always taste good. That's true. But it is always good for you. Always. Remember that folks. <laughs> Have a safe uh, and, eclipse watching out there everyone. Yes, absolutely. And if uh, the world still exists after uh this episode airs, um Please tune in again, because we love having you. Right on. Dimoitase. Wacha. I'm telling you right now, something is not right about this eclipse. This is the path that it will take, and it will cross over with the eclipse that we had in 2017, making an X on the country. Now, right there in the crosshairs, right there, is a town called Maconda, Illinois. Let's talk about it.
So this is a better look at the direct path of totality that the solar eclipse will take. Right there by Carbondale where the X meets is Maconda. Just as a fun fact for shiggles, this has never happened in the United States. We have never had two solar eclipse paths cross over on one town. So this is a pretty big fucking deal. Maconda really isn't that big of a deal. It has a population of like 500 people and it's known as a hippie town in Illinois. Now, what I did find interesting is that there is a giant city state park inside of Maconda. Are we waking up giants? Now, Maconda translated to South African, it means little ones. Are we the little ones and they're the big ones coming when the eclipse happens? Now, maybe I'm wilding out. Maybe I'm tripping. Maybe there's nothing to this. But if I am just wilding out and there is nothing to this, why have they already predicted a historical chance of cloud coverage on the day of the solar eclipse? Since when do they predict cloud coverage two months in advance? That shit is suspicious. The fact that this hasn't ever happened before is suspicious. The fact that there is a giant city-state park right outside Sewanee National Forest, which is known for Bigfoot sightings, is suspicious. So are the clouds a attempt to hide the eclipse from us so that we don't see what happens in the shadows? Thank you for listening to Tales from Atlantis, a project of the Chimali Institute of Mesoamerican Arts. If you enjoy the show, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter. You can do this by visiting talesfromastlantis.com and clicking support the podcast. Your continued support will help keep the podcast ad-free and independent. Until next time, Timo Itase.